Hi everybody, Ted Baldwin here, Third Coast Digital Films. We're in the studio today with Dr. Robert Smith, a nutritionist, chiropractic internist. And he's talking about the effects of different nutrients on how viruses affect the body. And I'm going to let Dr. Smith get into the discussion and I'll be asking some supplementary questions. We're trying to keep this to the level of information only. This is not medical advice. You're not being told to do anything. This is not to be construed as medical advice. And as a disclaimer, if you have an illness, if you believe you have an illness, or showing any symptoms at all, you must consult your own primary care physician. Do not attempt to use information in this program to treat yourself, because that is not what this is for. Thanks, Jeff. I uh, wanted to go over today some things that we've learned in the last few years about how viruses really make a difference on our body and how nutrition plays a part in it. What we've come to find out is some simple things we can do because the way viruses operate and specifically this COVID-19, one of the things it'll do is it goes into the lungs and when it replicates it causes the lung cell to bust open and as it opens up it lets the DNA of mitochondria loose. Now the mitochondria are the little power packs inside of each cell. They're the powerhouse of the cell. What's remarkable is we now know that the mitochondria exist in cells in numbers between 200 to 2,000 for every cell. In the case of lung tissue, it's usually about 1,000 to 1,500. So when that cell ruptures, it liberates that DNA from mitochondria into the system. Well, mitochondria come from basically origins of bacteria. So their DNA is a DNA type found in bacteria. Our body has developed an elaborate system to defend against bacterial infections. So being recognized as a bacterial infection coming in, our body sends white blood cells forward that take on that bacterial infection. And in this case, this cross-reaction leads to the overdevelopment of all these white blood cells going into the tissue, in the case of the lungs, this is what we refer to as pneumonia. This over-thickening area of white blood cells that blanket the area as a way to take out the bacteria. The problem is, it's not a bacterial DNA, it's actually the mitochondria. And it, in effect, makes the system overwhelm itself trying to fight a ghost that's not there. So one of the things we know about this is anything we can do to slow down the progression of that mitochondrial turnover being thrown out in there using things like nutrients like N-acetylcysteine because it does two things. It supports the glutathione pathway in a cell which is the antioxidant process. So it slows down how quickly a virus can replicate. The other thing it does is it also works as a mucolytic, something that thins mucus. So it makes it not this thick so when you cough you can get it up easier. It allows your body's cilia to move it out of your lung tissue and come back up so you get it out as sputum. And that's one of the things in simple nutrients. Other things that we found out are things like selenium, zinc, vitamin C. They all work in different ways to help your own immune system cooperate in getting rid of a viral infection and suppressing how quickly that virus can replicate. And that's the real part of this. So when someone is, is trying to treat the COVID-19 with hydroxychloroquine. It's but met. right, but they're not giving a zinc supplement with it. They're just using hydroxychloroquine. It's not effective because it's basically the system's being overwhelmed by too many different cofactors. And what it's going to be is similar to the situation when we looked at treating an HIV patient. It took several different parts of the cocktail. They consider using only pharmacological compounds, but we now know that nutrients, certain nutritional things, play a big part in how well your background is set up to be successful with working on a drug. And in the absence of these nutrients, it's very hard to get any drug to be successful. So one of the things we do is get people to realize that having a little bit of zinc in the, in the diet, having selenium in the diet, having enough vitamin C, having vitamin D, all of these play a big part in your body's ability to build up its own innate immune system, which makes it more capable of reacting, not just having a reaction to an infection, but having a modulated effect so it's not overwhelming so that people are, are absolutely clear about this. No one is suggesting that you go buy a bottle of selenium at a drugstore and then swallow the whole thing. 
there are recommended doses there are recommended amounts it's clearly printed on the labels what your recommended dosage is for a, a normal adult anything that's a, that you take needs to be done according to direction and according to the recommendations on labels and according to what your attending physician tells you. That's correct. Yes. Now, case in point, we specifically do not want people claiming that we told them to go buy a bottle of selenium and eat the whole thing because that'll make them better because that's not at all what we're saying. That's true. In fact, there's certain things that we know that only building them up over time of having an adequate amount of a certain amount of this makes the system work better which is why we're asking people to be aware of the fact that the dietary factors certain foods that you eat are going to have selenium rich products in them and that's why it's important to have a good balance in diet but in the case of nutrition if you need extra supplements you need to find someone who's skilled and can tell you what you would want to add into your system in the following presentation your discussion of this matter you go into great technical detail and you have a lot of technical detail on the slides that you're presenting but you want people to be able to have the information at hand so you're not trying to give them all of the information on the slide when you're on a particular slide but they can refer back to that slide merely by pausing the program and working backwards to understand what you're talking about at a given point that's correct. They can look at the information, they can see the sites and the references that are on there so they can go back and read and understand more about the details of the mechanisms that are being presented. So basic summarization. How would you basically summarize what's at hand? We know that the viral infection, specifically this one, the way that it makes its progression so rapid and makes it an overwhelming problem is that many individuals don't have a basic adequate nutrition level of things in their system that help to modulate their immune system. Many people are low in magnesium. Many people are low in vitamin D. These trace minerals that we talk about, selenium and zinc, all of those are turning out to be essential factors that allow a normal healthy immune system response to occur and not be overwhelmed by that initial onslaught when this the viruses rupture and give the impression of bacterial problems now by presenting that mitochondrial DNA. And if your system has these nutrients available, it does not allow for that rampant overdevelopment of the response in an inappropriate way. And that seems to be what's causing some of the older individuals, some of the more sickly individuals that have co-founding factors they already have nutritional problems and that makes it much more easy for them to be susceptible because their systems are being over ramped by this virus and the same process happens with other types of injuries and other types of infections the people that have poor nutritional status don't do as well in recovery people that are injured in accidents tend to not recover as well because they don't have that built-in ready reserve, if you will, in their system. So basically, pump up the nutrition, exercise, sunshine, yes, fresh air, all those things contribute. Yes, it does. And we are definitely not saying to not use a mask. If you want to use a mask, feel free to use a mask if you believe that will help. Um, to do other things that are recommended. You're certainly free to do all of those things. Well, social distancing does have the effect of diminishing some of the chances of being infected, for sure. And that's especially if you already know yourself to be an at-risk candidate by your age or by the other illnesses that you already know you have. It's wise to take a chance of doing everything you can to prevent becoming infected. But we know that those people that get infected that have very poor nutritional statuses are the ones that are having the bad outcomes. And we don't want bad outcomes. That's true. <laughs> okay. Well, on to the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. In the discussion today, we're presenting understanding that mitochondrial failure 
is the source of a lot of the problems that we're experiencing in dealing with critical ill patients who have viral infections, as well as other critical ill patients. The consequences of this are mitochondria can be supported by different nutritional factors that we can work on ourselves. We can make sure that we have adequate amounts of the nutrients needed for mitochondria, such as having enough vitamin D so that we're in the upper ranges of one-third of normal. That helps for good methylation to occur. You'll find out that it also has a positive impact if you have adequate zinc, adequate selenium in your diet. All of these can be found in some food sources or in some cases with supplementation. These will allow your body to better function in protecting the mitochondria because mitochondrial dysfunction is rampant in patients with these comorbidities such as high blood pressure, such as diabetes, such as chronic kidney problems. All of these are factors that can be addressed rather straightforward with taking care of your mitochondria. In the following presentation, I will go through the details of how the consequences of not having adequate nutrition occur and cause problems, as well as how appropriate interventions with nutrition can help these problems not to be as significant. Our goal for this is to understand that there are ways we can look at different things to address some of the problems that we're being seen. The Praquinel's effect would be more probably magnified if we realize the support needs to be dealing with this P66 SHC gene and this phenomenon is across the entire spectrum being recognized as an endothelial dysfunction driver. Low level exposure to this makes a big difference in how people survive such as in lupus and other conditions. All of these are addressing the problems that happen on a vascular level due to this inflammation. There's been other cross-reactive studies that have been done, such as different diseases that cause dysfunction in the vitamin D receptors and how the typical course leads to inflammation of the arterial lining. What's happened is we begin to appreciate the perspective that the fight on this particular problem is an endothelial dysfunction problem, and it's pretty consistently that way for many different problems. It turns out that this gene of the P66SHC has a paramount play in vascular endothelial function. It actually exists as a Janus type of molecule which has two different properties to it. One's beneficial when in low level small doses it helps to get over the hump of something that comes along that causes problem to the endothelial lining, the glycocalyx, the surface of the arteries. When the problem becomes overwhelming, this gene becomes overly expressed and it leads basically to the regulation of a certain process that causes the patient to become more likely to have everything from disseminating intravascular coagulation, basically making a blood clot through the entire system, to having blood clots form specific tissues. And this realization is this whole process is something that wasn't really appreciated until we realized that it's also it's an effect on the vascular endothelial growth factors. So we upregulate this can be done by different things. One of the problems we realized is high blood sugar can do it, but also the low density lipoproteins that have then been exposed to high blood sugar have now developed a characteristic of being able to stimulate the expression rapidly of this P66SHC. And we also realize that there's some underlying effects that directly drive this hypoglycemic action in that this becomes basically a process where your body develops a metabolic memory because of the high state of hyperglycemia that was exposed when it was created. The target comes down to this. We're missing the fact that mitochondrial failure is the cause of death in most of the patients that we're seeing in these critical care units and it's not just associated with viruses. We've known for a long time that glaciation, high blood sugar, has an effect on collagen. We know it has an effect on skin tissue. We have an effect on throughout the entire body. So when we look at a Maillard reaction, which is basically the fusing of sugar to any molecule in a body, whether it's fat 
or whether it's a protein, we have to appreciate the fact that that fusing process doesn't limit itself to red blood cell hemoglobin. We're all familiar with seeing someone be talking about they have a high A1C. That's a measurement that tells you sort of on average what the 120 day process of blood sugar has looked like on that patient. And that number is used as a calculation for 4.5 to 6 points, whatever, to find a normal range and exceedingly over that where we start talking about poorly controlled blood sugar. The appreciation is when that's happening, it's not just being limited to the RBCs in production. In fact, we know that for a fact, all of this is going to occur not just in the blood vessels, it's also going to affect in tissues of the brain, it's going to have problems with the extremities, all the arterial factors, all the uh, collagen that's being made will have more sugar driven into it through this Maillard reaction. And in the novel fact is when this happens, and it happens in the case of expression of that P66SHC gene, and it happens in the kidneys, we associate that with the nephropathy that develops inside the kidney. The glomerular tuff is actually being damaged. So this capillary arterial wall now has problems. This is where you get the progression of increased protein changes. This is where you see the BU and creatinine ratios change. And then you hit a certain point, we start doing the microalbunia test to see how long this patient is staged before they're going to be needing dialysis. The common pathway turns out to be for this molecular process, this is everything from aging to cardiovascular disease. This is a systemic problem that we need to really reevaluate our approach to. And in the case of when you're dealing with someone that already has these problems in an intensive care unit, the process needs to be done to help protect the vascular system. Because reactive oxygen stress forms in mitochondria, and that is a cellular-based problem. To appreciate this, these marked problems, you now have to deal with all the problems we realize that this is associated with markers that could probably be used to identify how badly the diabetic is progressing into other problems systemically. Because when we have the glucose work its way into the system, you can notice real quickly that it's going to start to crank up that gene. And when it does, the ultimate result is we're going to have the reactive oxygen species being produced through the electron train of this mitochondria and this is going to deal itself into cellular oxidative damage. And we know now for some time that the LDLs, the hyperglycemic factors, promote the turn on this gene. It increases the effect of this gene and the effect is it's going to have a stressing effect on mitochondria and in turn it becomes self-perpetuating of transcription, post-transcriptional activity. What's important to really get a good idea about this is we know for a fact things like sirtuin, these particular genes that exist can help downregulate the expression. This becomes important when we start looking at, okay, what do we know dietary factors help to reduce those sirtuin genes uh, being degraded, in fact, promote them so they kick on and help to suppress that P66SAC because this problem is not limited to one place. We're going to find out this becomes the reason driving factor, if you will, for the fibrotic liver changes that we notice that basically are going to play a part in the entire development of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it also becomes important because now realizing that this gene in this fibrotic state is not going to just be doing something in the background, it is a driver for that NLRP3 inflammasome. Inflammasomes are those inside every cell, not just the liver hepatocytes, that are in our body and all cells become inflamed, preloaded with these inflammasomes. These are the, what you see in patients that are in a hyperglycemic state ongoing for a long time or for patients that have, say, high levels of uric acid or several other things work as a driving factor. And if you look at this, our understanding now about receptors for different types of sugars have changed dramatically because now we realize this GLUT5 receptor 
is a genetically conserved receptor specifically for fructose that upregulates in the jejunum when we're presented with extra fructose. This is the process, say, of an evolutionary conserved receptor that during the summertime, early springtime, when you're exposed to higher numbers of fructose in the form of fruit, you eat it. Initially, you'll have a gastric problem that basically exists as a osmotic problem where you have diarrhea because you can't absorb all the fructose. Rather rapidly, you upregulate these genetic, uh, these evolutionary conserved receptors, the GLUT5, and you become capable of eating more and more fructose. Short-term durations, that's very beneficial because that fructose allows for you to take that into the portal circulation. It basically becomes 30% glucose, 70% fructose. That allows you to rapidly make triglycerides which allows you to make fat, which is a good thing if you're trying to fatten up during the early spring, early summer to go through the fall and winter where food is not abundant. The problem is continual exposure to this ends up changing the permeability factors of the intestines. So this then leads to chronic triglycerides going up. It has an increased amount of inflammation that's going to be produced because the permeability is going to allow for the bacterial endotoxins to leak into the intestines because you've changed the permeability gradient and this drives this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease which in turn is going to have the effect of making uric acid levels go up so your gout goes up. We know that this also has an effect on affecting renal disease because the fructose and the gout and the effect it's going to have on not being able to function and shave and protect the kidneys with your vitamin D receptors so then you have all these negative consequences on the kidney tissue. This leads to hypertension along with the fructose along with the uric acid. This is where you get the essential hypertension being driven and along with the salt absorption. Then we realize that there's other things out here that can make a big difference. We understand now that if there is a good omega-3 population in the diet, it has a process of liquid peroxidation, so the peroxisomes are not being negatively affected. But in the presence of these inflammatory drivers, it's the only thing you have to stop it. Vitamin E plays a part. We understand intracellularly that in the case of people that are having viral infections, or other processes, this N-acetylcysteine, which is a scavenger and helps with the glutathione pathway, helps to suppress the reactive oxygen stress. We know that this particular pharmaceutical compound does. We also know that sulforaphane will do the same thing because of its impact on the NRF2 and the anti-inflammatory uh, pathways. This also helps to block the reactive oxygen stress. We know that CoQ10 also does it. So we have several things that can help reduce and mitigate reactive oxygen stress that probably should be considered as a possibility if it's easily to do in somebody who's in intensive care. So in addition to the realization that all this blood sugar fuses into everything we own, including our fat, we now have come to the realization that on top of all that, we also have the issue of the fat stores all of the inflammatory cytokines. So all of those chemicals that we make of inflammation messengers that are circulating around because of high blood sugar will store in fat. In addition, we know that those particular cytokines basically begin to make our fat almost like an endocrine organ. So we have the interleukon-6, we have that tumor necrosing factor alpha, all of these different cellular messengers that we know for a fact are inflammatory in nature. We also know that the vascular endothelial growth factor is also going to be there. So all of these are being stored in the fat along with the high blood sugar moments. And then on top of that we have to realize that there's been for some time known that we have persistent organic pollutants that store inside of our fat when we have been exposed to it. So when we get around styrofoam cup in the form of polystyrene, this stuff is going to store. one 4 benzene this stuff stores. Xylene, that stores, ethylphenol, dioxin stores, benzene, toluene, and DDE. And the interesting part about this is this particular survey comes out of 1982. This is 10 years after Richard Nixon had banned DDT. So we're still having persistence of the residual breakdown product of DDE found in 98% of the population at that time. 
We also now understand that metformin, one of the things it does is the effect on the vascular endothelial growth factor is it works as an inhibitory. So it works to block that and this is a beneficial thing to the arterial lining because you're suppressing the P66SHC gene. So a lot of the things we're going to be wanting to try to do is to suppress the gene expression of this, especially when you're dealing with somebody who is in a critical care state. Because we now know that these sirtuin genes block basically the acetylation process of the P66H, which reduces that problem from the vascular oxidative stress. So the endothelial system does better in the presence of these particular compounds. And because of this, it's important to realize this particular portion has an effect on the vascular part of it because it actually changes not only just the effect of that particular gene, but it also has an effect on the vascular endothelial growth factor itself. This vascular endothelial growth factor has multiple things that we've identified as drivers that have deleterious effects when they happen in extremely overabundant places. And once you realize that this is a renal pathology, the adaptive role of this protein becomes over the top. Many people that are dying with COVID-19 have the problem of chronic kidney disease when they show up, and a lot of them are expiring due to kidney failure. The reactive oxygen stress takes them out. And when you look at what we already know about chronic kidney disease, and now understanding this P66SAC process, this is part of the entire thing that's being exposed of mitochondrial stress leading to mitochondrial failure. The evidence about this thing is not unique to humans, but it's throughout the entire system. And this governance factor, the NRF2 factor, the anti-inflammatory stress elements pathways, are basically showing you the bifunctional part of P66SHC. In short doses, it has positive benefits. When it becomes overly abundant and continually expressed, that's when you start seeing the manifestations that lead to problems. We know that the sulforaphane helps to block the presence of something called homocysteine. That's a good thing because we're trying to make sure we protect that NRF2 process as well as reduce into plasma particular stress. All of these work together to foster more problems on the liver. And this is the mechanism that sort of explains how this fibrotic state starts on more of the molecular pathway way. The glycocalyx is the endothelial lining that's inside in the presence of all the arterioles and arteries. These are super important, it turns out, because this actually has a gradient effect of causing the coalescence of the bigger formed elements to float more naturally inside of the arterial and the artery. It reduces the coefficient drag of blood flow because the effect of seeing this plasma line up against the side of the glycocalyx actually almost has like a Teflon effect, if you will, in allowing for resistance to be reduced for the flow of the red blood cells, white blood cells, and even some of the immune complexes. The problem is, when you have issues with this P66SHC gene, you're literally having the effect of that glycocalyx being not just simply shredded, shedded, absorbed, and reprotected and going back into the system. That becomes disrupted, and it's not reabsorbed. You can have continual shedding. This is in turn going to have effect on changing the resistance to the flow of blood, changing an increase of the pressure because of swelling of the endothelial cells lining the arterioles, and in turn this is going to cause signaling of a chemical nature that's going to cause your blood pressure to go up. The glycocalyx itself begins to make pretty good sense when we understand that this regulating mechanism we're looking at is going to be an effect on mechanical transduction of these signals into from pressure as well as the chemical effects of the P66SAC on the mitochondria itself. The protective mechanisms of the NRF2 factors, it reduces the reactive oxygen stress. It enhances our ability to deal, deal with and repair the unfolded protein response of the endoplasmic reticulum. It also helps to reduce nucleic factor kappa B. All of this basically is in counterbalance to the drive of what diabetes is doing. Because diabetes initiates processes that basically make all of these a problem. Because reactive oxygen stress needs to be appreciated as high blood sugar. It's 
elevated glucose, that effect and tend causes the active reaction, uh, the age like advanced glaciated end products and the reactive age, uh, receptors from the advanced glaciated end products to become activated. And we have to remember that mitochondria have many things that can cause problems. The dysfunction with them can be of a nutritional deficit type, it could be the excessive carbohydrate type, it could be the molecular parts, it could be the fact that you have the gases produced inside the intestines, the herbicides that we get exposed to, the pesticides we get exposed to. All of this leads to more reactive oxygen stress, which in turn produces more mitochondrial dysfunction. We need to feed the mitochondria because this has been shown to be a critical factor in critical ill patients' convalescence. In fact, it's been shown that even as long as six months after getting out of intensive care, some of these patients are exposed or are showing deficits in mitochondrial function. So what we need to do is to consider this information that's been exposed and the fact that we can now realize these nutrients or supplies are critically important to keep your mitochondria functioning well. And quite obviously, some of these could be used to help address part of the problem that you see with some of the patients in critical care states, such as ascorbic acid by IV, uh, N-acetylcysteine by IV. These sort of things could make a big difference in changing recovery rates. Because in the critically ill state, having already in existence an insulin repaired uh, resistance problem, the loss of muscle mass is already a problem. These mitochondrial functions become more aggravated. The production of ATP is compromised. Lactic acid builds up. And these are going to make problems not just for lung tissue, but for all tissues. So adequate micro, uh, micronutrients can make a short-term improvement and also have a long-term effect on a patient's cognitive function in the process. We know already a lot of the different nutrients that are required for the five complexes of the electron chain transport. This is not information that's new to us. It's just realizing that mitochondria are a critical factor is important because we know that antioxidant depletion is real. It happens all the time for many reasons. Free radical overbearance becomes a problem. We know that mitochondrial dysfunction is associated with a lot of chronic disease processes, in fact. And these chronic disease processes are usually associated, in many cases, with low-level viral infections that are running in the background. So just being aware of the fact that we now know that this sort of problem here with instituting more nucleic factor kappa B has an effect on viral replication, it has an impact on how quickly they mutate, and it exacerbates the viral infections themselves. So the entire cascade that you watch happen at this level right here pretty much is the example of the viral storm. And now we realize that even in healthy individuals, when they're injected with small amounts of the endotoxins that are released from these bacteria, it has an effect on mitochondrial function. In fact, we have found out that within two to four hours, it's causing changes inside the muscle functions of patients that are perfectly healthy, which is important because now we realize that it's not so much the energy process that's being associated with taking down. It actually turns out to have an effect in what we're looking at of the changes that have occurred in the enzymes that are inside mitochondria in such a way that the permeability of the mitochondria has changed. And this turns to basically a low-level problem. In the case of chronic exposure to these low-level things, it's believed this is what the problem is. It's a dose-dependent issue. In the case of the, the liver cells, the hepatocytes, mitochondrial respiratory changes are altered in the continual exposure to this low-level of permeability changes in the intestines. In the case of the viral infections, it's actually going to be a little bit more interesting because we realize that this lipopolysaccharide in of itself is going to alter the ATP production and it's going to be a driver of this compromised mitochondrial function systemically. Once we look at this process, the same engine inflammation, reactive oxygen stress, is going to be going systemically through the system. And we now realize that in the case of the critically ill patient, 
when they've done tests and find out as the sepsis induces multi-organ failure, one of the progressional signs is the intercostal muscles become such a way that they're no longer contracting well and leg muscles are not functioning well in these patients due to mitochondrial problems. Mitochondrial dysfunction is a biogenesis of what we're seeing in ICU, death from mitochondrial failure. This is not just something unique to the COVID-19, but this is actually part of what kills most people in ICU. Because this mitochondrial dysfunction is due to the failure of the mitochondria to have enough nutrients. And in the ICU patient, a lot of times they're showing up preloaded with problems. And we know that though they say there's no secondary clear pathway for mitochondrial dysfunction, that's not true with today's science because we do know that this process is causing problems by the ATP system, by the reactive oxygen system, by the overloading of the primary secondary messenger system of calcium through the n methyl aspartate receptors. But more importantly, we realize that these ICU patients are developing these symptoms that cascade and follow progressive lines. We need to remember that we're looking at these problems at the mitochondrial dysfunction, but in a different way than what we've appreciated in the case of these viruses. And these viruses, what we're dealing with is a lung cell that has 1,100 to 1,500 mitochondrial cells because it's a high metabolic tissue. This mitochondria is used to make energy. So in the case of a viral infection superimposed in that colony of high mitochondria, as the virus replicates and it bursts open through cell lysis, it's now liberating from the cell the mitochondria DNA. And this damage associated molecular pattern, mitochondrial DNA, is unfortunately a bystander effect of bacterial evolution that gave us the mitochondria to begin with. Because in our case, we have bacteria that are recognized as a pathogen associated molecular model, and we recognize bacterial DNA through toll like receptor number nine. And the white blood cell type of neutrophils are perfectly capable of regulating to address a fulminating bacterial infection. Unfortunately, in this particular case, it's a bacterial infection. What we're looking and witnessing here, this is the explanation for the fulminating pneumonia that's being seen. And the reactive oxygen stress and the presence of mitochondrial DNA makes these cellular cytokines crank up. In the case of the diabetic patient or other comorbidities, they've already loaded up with plenty of additional inflammasomes. So when the cell lyses, these chemicals are being thrown out in addition to what's being caused and can be driven by the toll-like receptor number nine from the mistaken mitochondria DNA being taken as a bacterial DNA. And when you start looking at this as an acquired massive mitochondrial dysfunction systemically, then you can appreciate the multi-organ dysfunction because all of those damage associated molecular pattern receptors, whether they be mitochondrial DNA or other pattern recognition receptor parts that our body picks up and makes white blood cells and defense systems cascade up, the protein modulation of all this through cytokines and all the different components of coagulation factors the endothelial dysfunction becomes astronomically elevated. You have the cardiovascular components. In the case of some of the other viruses, say like uh, hemorrhagic fever or Ebola, which have direct effects even more profoundly on the microcirculation, uh, leading to bleeding out of the eyes and nose and things like that. In the case of the COVID-19, the coronavirus types, we're dealing with respiratory things that are being driven through that uh, toll-like receptor number nine. You get similar problems in gut because that same process happens and leads to some of the fulminating diarrhea that's seen. When it happens in the Bowman's capsule and it's affecting that P66SHC gene that's already compromised in the diabetic patient, it becomes that much quicker of a cascade down to kidney failure. The hepatic problems, the uh, dealing with encephalitis, this is your progression to the major organ dysfunction syndrome that's seen so many times in these patients that have so many problems and they don't have enough nutrients to modulate the immune response. 
because we know that mitochondria have got lots of things going on and we know that there are other toxins and things that can make a difference in how well they function and in the absence of good antioxidant presence these mitochondria can't be able to be beneficial because one of the things we've realized is like selenium it has an antiviral effect antibacterial effect through the primitive immune system the innate immune system has zinc fingers it has uh, selenium processes that work basically through fenton reactions to take out certain target tissues iron is not used in this process because from an evolutionary standpoint iron would be a poor choice for us to actually use to deal with any type of infection because if it was you'd have all your blood being involved instantaneously and we understand that we already know there's quite a few in the population that exist that are nutritionally deficit this was the same problem in uh, the 1918s when we started looking at the Spanish flu they came back a few years later and were looking at uh, soil nutrition levels in Congress in the 20s and realized that in 1920 that there was deficiencies available for people like selenium, zinc, those sort of things and they believed that was part and parcel a com combination effect of why this particular uh, Spanish flu was such a uh, virulent strain. A word about methylation. There are inexpensive ways nutritionally to support methylation and we know for a fact that low status of these particular nutrients can play a significant part in not having good methylation. Magnesium is listed as being almost a subclinical pathology because it's so currently so predominant in the population at whole, as well as a lot of the nutrients we've missed it, uh, mentioned about zinc and selenium. In acetylcysteine, things like these can be utilized beneficially to help support patients. The realization that vitamin D is the controlling factor significantly for 223 genes is more paramount when you then realize that of those 223 genes, some of those genes are involved in significant components of methylation. So in reality, low vitamin D is also going to be associated with hypomethylation, which then means you have the ability to have things happen in a negative consequence in viruses and even cancers. Because in the case of hypomethylation, you then allow for the Epstein-Barr virus, as we talked about in the prior series, becomes a problem. The human papillomas virus becomes a problem. They both will increase your ability to replicate. N-acetylcysteine works to inhibit viral replication, has already been demonstrated in the influenza virus that was fairly pathogenic here some time back, and it works as an inhibitory of replication. N-acetylcysteine can work very well to help reduce viscosity as it breaks the nucleotidic bonds. Magnesium deficiencies are associated with inducing anxiety by its impact on the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, and dysregulation of this has been recommended as part of the problem to be considered with general interventions for anxiety medication to make sure magnesium levels are adequate. n aspartate receptor is the driver for a lot of these problems. Magnesium sits right here. Zinc sits right here. They work as blocking mechanisms for a lot of the chemicals we associate with the tryptophan shunt out of the intestines. So quinolic acid builds up, we have even more calcium being driven in. This in itself is going to drive reactive oxygen stress. There are many different plants, chemicals, uh, of the phytonutrient types that have an impact on blocking many of these different pathways that we've talked about. And we've even realized that Revestitol, the stuff we talk about with grapes, we talk about the, working as a rapalog and inhibiting the mammalian target of rapamycin. So it works to downregulate inflammation. This becomes important when we realize this effect is being expressed, its effect on the sirtuin gene, and it upregulates by helping to block the P66 SHC promotion process. This in of itself has a profound effect. There are many such examples of this, but this particular one realizing that high blood sugar has the negative effect and the memory effect, 
So what we're going to be trying to do is use these different compounds to address blocking this process. There are many different things that we now realize that are important to consider when dealing with viral infections as well as other processes that go on in critical ill patients. Supporting glutathione pathways with NAC is a simple intervention that could be done because we know now it's already present, available readily. We also know that vitamin C, IV, can have an effect on the scavengers of reactive oxygen stress, a mitochondrial problem. Our goal for this is to understand that there are ways we can look at different things to address some of the problems that we're being seen. The Proquinel's effect would be more probably magnified if we realize the support needs to be dealing with this P66 SHC gene. And this phenomenon is across the entire spectrum being recognized as an endothelial dysfunction driver. So in summation, we've gone over a lot of the details of how mitochondria dysfunction evolves into mitochondrial failure. We went over the nutrients, we went over the consequences. We now have a game plan to, before you get sick with anything, to make some problems less of a problem. And we also have a way, if you do have someone that's sick, things that we realize will be beneficial to helping them recover. All of the slides have a great deal of detailed information with citations. I added that so that you can go back at your own pace to get a better depth of knowledge as to why and how these occurrences of mitochondrial dysfunction evolve into mitochondrial failure and use this as a roadmap so you can appropriately make interventions when people are being forced to make quick decisions. Thank you. Very good. <coughs> Is this thing on? Okay. Hi, I'm Bumpkin Seed, the star of Chagani Apple Seed Adventures, starring Bumpkin Seed. Okay, I would like to welcome you to the Ozone Film Festival, and I hope you have a great weekend. On August 11th and 12th of 2016, a stalled no-name storm dumped 31 inches of rain in southeastern Louisiana in 24 hours. Four trillion gallons of water caused unprecedented levels of flooding in five parishes. And the estimated destruction of 40,000 homes and as many businesses. The members of United Associated Plumbers and Steamfitters Local 198 decided the right thing to do was mobilize a workforce to help its members, their families, neighbors, and others recover from the damages caused by the flood. Union members from surrounding communities. Prayer helps a lot. Prayer helps a whole lot. If it wasn't for having faith in the Lord, you wouldn't have faith enough to be doing this. And good Lord willing, things will get back like they used to be. In 2016, we one day woke up and had to realize that we are all the same. And by the grace of God, we are all gonna be okay. Let's not forget what happened here. Not with the devastation, but with the compassion, the support, and the caring and love that was given to this community in their time of need. Louisiana is no stranger to adversity. People are helping one another heal, and the story of survival and success in the face of this flood will simply become a part of the proud history of a resilient culture. United Associated Plumbers and Steamfitters Local 198 appreciates on behalf of its members every person and organization that donated in some way to this effort. It's gonna be alright Alright It's gonna be alright Alright my sister
is gonna be alright No matter how far down you are My brother, you can be lifted up With the flicker of a switch Your whole world can be relit up Alright It's gonna be alright Alright, my brother It's gonna be alright Alright It's gonna be alright Alright, my brother It's gonna be It's gonna be alright The little children say A-L-R-I-G-T